Well, welcome to all of you. It's a pleasure to have you with us today uh, for this very important webinar. We are very pleased to have so many people from around the world join us today and to uh, discuss what I think is not just uh, an important um, announcement and, and unveiling, but something that I think will have um, great significance in years to come. <clears throat> I will begin by hoping that all of you are safe and healthy where, wherever you're located and that uh, your families are doing well under the, the current very difficult circumstances. Uh, during the pandemic, the Nuclear Energy Agency has taken full advantage of the technologies of, um, of web-based platforms to make announcements, to have various events. And of the ones that we have done, I don't know that there's anything that has been more important in the discussion of the generalized nuclear database structure. Nuclear data is the basis of all the work that we do. Any facilities that are designed, any fuel that is, is used in reactors, um, any materials that are applied uh, requ require the, the analysis using the most modern and up-to-date nuclear information. <clears throat> These basic science, this basic science information is something that is an international asset. Um, an asset that is of value to all countries, no matter um, what part of the world in which they're located. There is no competition for nuclear data, or at least there should not be a competition for nuclear data. It's something that is additive. It's a, it's a positive sum game. In that respect, international organizations have a special role to coordinate the accumulation of nuclear data and the dis dissemination of nuclear data. And this is a role the NEA has played since the 1980s. Basic neutron physics data is the building blocks of all nuclear facilities, and we have been measuring this information since the 1930s. Over the course of time, our collection of data has become more and more sophisticated. But in the 1970s, we achieved a standard that was based largely on the use of punch cards um, that has persisted really to the current time. If we're going to advance and be able to use nuclear data and advanced simulation and other technologies, we're going to have to see advances in how we structure our data, and how the data is, is passed from um, user to user and assuring that there are no mistakes. The worldwide community has been brought together um, to create a new data standard. It's been about a six year process and I'm sure you'll hear a little bit more about that from the speakers today. And we are now in the process of hosting the development of the standard um, and the tools necessary to integrate it into systems around the world. Many laboratories around the world have participated in this, uh, in the United States, France, Japan, and other countries, and many of them are developing prototypes or using or testing the, the use of the structure now. So this is really an announcement that um, isn't just the beginning because the work is already well underway, but it's a very exciting announcement. It's one that I believe um, will create a new format that will um, leverage all the expertise of our member countries to ensure that all countries can use this data in the most effective manner. To give you greater detail about this, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. David Brown from Brookhaven National Laboratory, who's been instrumental in this work, and I pass the floor to him. Dr. Brown, please. Uh, um, thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'm just learning how to use this system. I was muted. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us with this webinar and I hope you are all uh, safe and sound. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm going to introduce the generalized nuclear database structure. Um, so can we go to the next slide? Okay, so uh, as uh, Dr. Magwood mentioned, you know, nuclear data is really the it's kind of the secret sauce that understand, make, enables our understanding of nuclear systems. And nuclear reactions are really complex. They're, they're hard to model. Uh, from first principles, they effectively have to be tabulated and uh, given to uh, codes for use in simulations. And as the graph on the left uh, shows, the, the size and complexity of this reaction data has been increasing markedly over the years and is only projected to continue growing. <clears throat> and it's really uh, essential for uh, the you know, next generation of simulations, such as are shown in the, in the right panel, which is a, a VERA simulation of uh, a, a WB2 reactor core, uh, and this is the, the Xenon-135 production. So to make this plot 
you would of course need all the, the neutron interaction data, but you also need fission product yield data too, because that's what xenon is, and heating data and a whole variety of other things. And this is, you couldn't have done it without the underlying nuclear data. Uh, next slide. So um, this cartoon illustrates in a very high level how nuclear data gets from basic science uh, theory and experiment all the way to the user. And of course, our goal is to get that highest quality data and uncertainties to the users for use in a variety of applications. Uh, next slide. So, oh, that didn't come out well. Um, oh, well. Um, the NDEF-6 format has been the standard nuclear data format since uh, roughly 1968. Uh, and this is important because uh, nuclear data, the, the, the NDEF format defines not just how the physics that we use to represent the interactions, but it also defines how codes communicate. In particular, it defines how uh, the sort of middle segment of the nuclear data pipeline communicate. That means evaluations are produced melding theory and experiment into something in the end of format, which is then processed in a processing code. The output is typically in a variation of the end of six format where it is fed into a transport code and then the downstream validation and then onto the user. Uh, thing is, this end of six format is, a, it is tied to this obsolete punch card infrastructure. That's what the picture on the right was supposed to show. Um, but it also, um, rigidly defines what physics can be represented by the format. And uh, I should also mention it's been uh, maintained by the cross-section evaluation group uh, It's part of the US Department of Energy since 1968. Next slide. So GNDS is a, a I would say a modern collaborative international replacement for NDEF6. It goes far beyond just a simple format. It's kind of a uh, a hierarchy, an ontology of, of, of nuclear reactions. And with this general structure, we can serialize data into a variety of formats, including legacy formats, such as NDEF-6, that you can see in the graphic on the right, uh, ACE, GenDEF, uh, various other in-house formats. It can also be serialized into HDF5 and XML. These are what we use in production. It can also be used to generate APIs for use in uh, codes that then talk to GNDS data, and such a things already exist in C++ thanks to uh, the, the work of Oak Ridge, and it's not too hard to imagine using doing it with other languages. Um, next slide. Um, so th this is a, a quick overview of the status of implementation of GNDS. Uh, there is a full implementation at Livermore, both in a processing code called Fudge and in an API, uh, Giddy. Actually, there's a couple of uh, some parts of Giddy. Uh, you'd have to ask Caleb if you're interested. Both of them are open source. Uh, the Ampex and Enjoy are in the process of, of uh, implementing N uh, GNDS support already, and, and Ampex is pretty far along. And uh, other processing codes, uh, Galilei and Friendly in, in France and Japan, it is expected in the future. So, um, next slide. Um, this is my last slide. just want to show that it's not just that we have a format defined and we're talking about how wonderful it is, but it's actually in production. These are uh, simulations from Livermore. Uh, <clears throat> they're processing codes using GNDS format data and the Giddy API. And uh, it's a pretty busy plot. What's important <clears throat> is uh, the band in the middle with the, air, the error band. These are, uh, each one of these is a different um, a critical assembly simulation. The target is not the black benchmark data, really. It's uh, MCMP, because uh, we we're, were simulating the decks as represented in MCMP. So you're looking to compare the orange triangles with the red squares. And you see that overall, they're in very good agreement. And as you, if you can read the labels, you can see that also includes support for thermal neutron scattering, which was something that was always problematic in Livermore codes. Um, so uh, with that, I just want to um, uh, give a few minutes to each one of the panelists to uh, describe how uh, they are using GNDS and interacting with it. And I believe the, the first person is uh, Osamu Iwamoto. 
Okay, thank you for the introduction. That uh, my name is Osamu Iwamoto. Uh, I'm uh, working in the uh, Japan Atomic Energy Agency, and uh, I'm uh, developing the nuclear data library. And uh, 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 GNDS is uh, very important because the nuclear data uh, must be given some format that could be the interface between the uh, nuclear data and the processing code that we are also developing the uh, processing code friendly and the at the moment, we, we are uh, using the uh, old current and the six format that uh, that is a uh, new format may be a uh, good uh, future uh, additional future uh, in the future and uh, I think that uh, good for checking the nuclear data format itself to uh, give the uh, more reliable new data uh, to the world. Okay. Thank you. All right, I think, I think I'm next. Um, my name is Caleb Mattoon. I'm from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And um, so in addition to the comments that Dave made, I, wanna, I just want to mention that we recognize that switching formats is going to be a big lift, that there's a lot of work to be done in terms of getting codes up to date. One of the ways that we're trying to help facilitate that, not only for here at Livermore, but, uh, but throughout the world, is um, what, sort of two fronts I want to mention. One was a recent WPAC subgroup that I co-led along with Jeremy Conlin from Los Alamos that focused on starting to build up this infrastructure. And that was both APIs for accessing the data so that we could help at the, the end users um, to get the data from GNDS into their codes. Um, and then also some efforts, Livermore, Dave mentioned two codes that we have published that are open source. One of them is Fudge, which is intended for interacting with evaluations, uh, producing evaluations, processing them. Um, and I think in a little bit later this morning, uh, Jean-Christophe will talk about an effort to, uh, to use Fudge to generate the, the Tendal library. Um, and that's, that's something that I've been a part of and has been a fun and interesting endeavor and then the other one is this Giddy Plus code, which uh, has also been released. These are, is an API for accessing data in uh, GNDS uh, using C++ library. So both of those codes are available. They're out on the GitHub site. And I, anybody who's interested in them, please, please let us know. I can easily point you to the link there. Um, but yeah, the hope is that we can make this as easy a transition for everybody as possible. So I think that's, that's all I had to say. Uh, hi. Next is Fausto Malvagi. Thanks, Dave. So I'm Fausto Malvagi from CA France, uh, and I work in a unit where we develop neutron transfer simulation code for reactor applications, and we do both uh, Monte Carlo simulation with the Tripoli series as well as deterministic uh, codes uh, with the Apollo series. We also develop uh, a data treatment code, which is called Galilee, which transforms neutron data basically from the evaluation form uh, to the form that is uh, specific to our codes. Uh, I just would like to stress that we call this treatment, but treatment is not just a format translation from one syntax to a different syntax. It actually data need to go through a lot of numerical transformation that can be algorithmically complex and computer expensive. So it's a real work uh, to get the thing done. And, and, and that is important to keep in mind. Uh, so for many years, we at CRA, like everybody else, used the ND, NDF format for changing data because it was the standard. And it was the standard because it was is well defined, is unambiguous, and it is much machine readable. It's very important to be machine readable because there's a lot of data involved. So you don't want to amuse yourself just doing it by hand. Uh, unfortunately, the NDF format has got some um, technical limitations that make it sort of hard to change on one hand. But from my point of view, even more important is, is that it's basically only machine readable. Because the untrained human eye, you look through the files, it's just a bunch of numbers. It takes years 
to understand what the numbers mean. Uh, and that's not something that is sustainable uh, nowadays. For one thing, the fact that it is not human readable makes it actually fairly easy for mistakes to go undetected. There's a little bug in the reading program and then everything goes uh, a wire. Uh, on the other hand, when, you, when we show that to young researchers who come uh, to us, they just recognize right away dinosaur from the past. And this is not good to attract good talents. Uh, so our treatment called Galilee, Galilee, I don't know how to say that in English, uh, is actually, he's got his own internal memory data structure to do all the treatment, the medical treatments that needs to be done. So for us, or better for the treatment code, format ENDF or GNDS is just persistent file formats. The only things that are impacted by change of format are just the input and up to output routines. All the rest of the codes, which is many, many thousand lines of codes, are totally unaffected by the change of format. Uh, yes. Uh, so what we are doing now is going through the process of adding to the already existing input and output routines, the routines that are specific to, to GNDS. Uh, so the idea is to be able to use both formats when they are equivalent and when they are not equivalent to use the appropriate format, basically, which we believe is actually and yes. Um, we are planning to get to have our code ready by the end of next year, and when it will be ready, it will be available on the uh, NEA data bank. Uh, so I just want to stress at the end that uh, we, we do think that moving to the GNS format is an important step in the modernization of the field, if you want, and putting put in our field in the next uh, area, and which is why actually we contributed from the very beginning to all the work groups uh, about the specification of GNDS uh, format, about the API that Caleb was talking about, and we do strongly support the move from an NDF to GNDLs, we think is a very good thing. Thank you. I guess I'm next. Hi, I'm Doriada from Oak Ridge National Lab, and I'm the code manager of Ampex and SAMI. SAMI is our code to, uh, for evaluation, and Ampex is our processing code. And as we develop no new features in SAMI that not necessarily fit into the old NDF file format, we would like to add them into the new GNDS and write GNDS uh, natively and access natively from both Ampex and SAMI. And then of course also have them immediately available in the processing code and then that makes the libraries for our transport codes. So the way that currently works is that Ampex already has an API that consists of two levels. One is an in-memory structure that has all the data and this data can be filled from NDEV and partially also from GNDS. And all the codes therefore, as Fausto said, never access the NDEV data directly, but only and interact over it with the API. And we also want to implement that API in SAMI. And uh, currently distributed with scale 6.3 beta, we already can read the resonance parameters in Ampex. We are in the process of adding it to SAMI. And uh, now that the GNDS is actually defined by JSON files from which the documentation is done, we are in the process of finalizing access to the Python code that reads the JSON files and generates the low level access classes for GNDS. And then the next layer to that is from the low level access classes to our in memory structure and then into Ampex and GNDS and, and SAMI to read it. And we are hoping to finalize that soon and hopefully then we'll share it on our Ampex open source website. And as I said, I want to stress that none of the codes need to change because they will only access the already existing in memory structure so that only the lower level that reads the file will be changing. Thank you. And finally, we have uh, John Christoph. 
simple. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for your participation. My name is Jean-Christophe Sublet. I'm the head of the Nuclear Data Service Unit of the Nuclear uh, Data uh, Service of the um, International Atomic Energy Authority. And of course, the, the International Atomic Energy Authority is welcoming uh, the now uh, mature uh, uh, GNDS. Um, I just want to emphasize that, as Dave said, it, uh, this is a structure. That's not quite a format. It's much more complete than the, the structure. I would like as well, to stress that it's important to keep in mind that the legacy format, the MDF6, is going to tag along the compatible GNDS form uh, to cert uh, for certainly a decade from now. GNDS form are going to be much more attractive worth investing in, uh, into uh, to those that have found limitations in the legacy format and want or need to push the boundary of science further. Um, the uh, a few library already exists in the GNDS format and uh, looking at in the past. Uh, it exists since uh, 2010 in its infancy, but now major library have been uh, uh, delivered and are delivered in that new format. That new format that uh, can be uh, exist in different XML form and is much more appealing to more and more modern applications like, uh, as it's been said, Giddy, MacGiddy, Enjoy, we hope 23, Mercury, Andra, or even directly into uh, inventory code, uh, such as SPISPAC2. We've started to support uh, through our uh, systems, its diplo deployment on, on multi-level systems. First, uh, we uh, participated into the WPEX subgroup, but now we are engaging directly in support for upstream, that means the productions of nuclear data directly from model code into the GNDS structure, and downstream, of course, when you need to feed uh, those huge amount of very complex data to the different code. Well, I think what needs to be said is that GNDS is particularly well equipped to answer the need of today and tomorrow in answering the trans physics the multi-scale, the multi-physics aspect of the problems we are facing now. I think this is important. And it, it is also important to, stay, to say that uh, GNDS is still at the Fermi gradation. Those are basic nuclear data structure. They belong to everybody. Everybody should be able to use it from astrophysics to medical science to producing energy or to any other uh, 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 physics uh, savant society that need the nuclear data. Thank you. Dr. Brown, I'm going to have to uh, disappear on you here, but I wanted to just once again, uh, thank you for, for the work that you've done to, to help move us in this direction. And congratulations really to the whole community uh, for bringing this to reality. And um, I, I, I I, I think I'll leave with a noting uh, to uh, Dr. Riata that um, a very important uh, woman scientist, Dr. Catherine Way, was very instrumental in the early work of nuclear data structures. Um, so I'm pleased to have someone from Oak Ridge here to, to launch this new, this new era. Uh, so with that, um, I, I thank all of you and um, enjoy the rest of the webinar. And we look forward to seeing this new, this new format, not format, but new standard, new structure. Um, spread around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so uh, at this point, we will open it up for questions. And um, don't so um, this, I have the uh, first question I have is, uh, like what, what sort of effort is going to be required for users and code developers to switch from their existing code systems to GNDS? And what are we doing to ease the process? Um, this is kind of a, a big question for, since everybody here is involved in some level of making processing codes or APIs. So uh, maybe we can go, go through all of the panelists. Um, so we'll start with, with you, Jean-Christophe. 
you're muted. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I should be unmuted. I think there, uh, we should, at the IA, we should be there to help uh, uh, those people uh, uh, to, to pass uh, all that information uh, from uh, the new uh, structure to the new code. I think it's much easier uh, than people think it is. And uh, with uh, Caleb, we started, and I think within a couple of months, it has been very successful to translate enormous amount of data, for example, produced uh, by a model code uh, named uh, Thalys T6, an entire system, and to pipe that through quite successfully uh, through the GLDS structure. And uh, this has required uh, the involvement of uh, two, three person, and now it's working. The, 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 the translation has been done. I'm quite sure uh, that like uh, the company in the Silicon Valley, we've done it, we will have to fix it, because it's uh, always an ongoing uh, process. But uh, I see there is a, a, a large amount of hope in doing that. And I think this is the solution forwards uh, because of the more and more complex uh, trans uh, physics, uh, trans science society answer we need to stimulate. Right. Um, Caleb? Yeah, so I think um, in addition to focusing on the, the evaluation side of it, I think there's going to be a lot of effort continually to, uh, to put new data and to, to help evaluators get data easily into GNDS. But the other part that Livermore has been focusing on is just getting data then to the application codes. And uh, this was indeed, it was a big effort. Uh, it was something that required the cooperation of the nuclear data, data team and the developers of those transport codes. Uh, but we've been successfully able to get both our, we have a Monte Carlo code that's developed at Livermore that's called Mercury and a deterministic transport code that's called Ardra. And both of those codes are now able to both read the legacy formats that they had always been using as well, or they can flip a switch and instead read the data from GNDS and do this intercomparison of answers between the two. And um, I think uh, one one idea that I that I think is worth everybody thinking about is that uh, we can either have a lot of different institutions go and try to implement an API like that. And I think there's some definitely some value in having multiple implementations of an API because then we can cross check, we can do these code comparisons. But I think it is also worth, you know, part of part of our goal in making uh, our codes open source was that we wanna, you know, the lessons that we learned and the bugs that we found as we went through this progress process, we'd like everybody else to have the advantage of that also. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that, that's uh, I think uh, hopefully a good route forward. Um, I wanted to just, there was one thing that popped up in the chat um, so that attendees are aware that uh, rather than using the raise your hand feature of Zoom to, it's better to put the questions into the chat window um, and then we can all see them easily. Thank you, Kevin. So, yeah. um, so uh, next, uh, Osamu. Very speaking, uh, we are not uh, using that. Yet. So sorry. <laughs> then uh, we will, uh, there are some activity in the uh, WPEC subgroup to uh, making the uh, API or uh, uh, utility to deal with uh, the GNDS format. Then uh, we would like to use uh, such a uh, code or uh, libraries to deal with uh, nuclear data library formats. Also, uh, yes. Well, it, it was David that show at some point one of the slide, little line that goes from the physicist who make experiments and make evaluation and goes to the end user. And at some point in there, there was the treatment codes. So the way I see the GNDS is is an exchange basically between the physicists that think up the the, the numbers. Uh, the codes, you need to, to use them, but there are a lot of codes who, uh, who solve the transport equation, but there are very few codes that actually treat data. And those are the codes that are mostly impacted by the change in format. 
And we are talking about probably less than 10 processing code in the entire world nowadays. Uh, and everything down the line is not really impacted because what the processing codes do, they exactly they make uh, the, the transfer between the physics and the codes. So again, uh, what we have done to ease the, the transition is basically getting together uh, for at least half of the processing codes in the world, we are getting together once a year to discuss about the GNDS, how to, how to change it, how to make it uh, available, usable for, for uh, everybody. So uh, I, I don't think that all that many people are actually impacted uh, directly. They all are gonna be impacted indirectly because all the users go through the processing codes. But there's only a handful of processing codes that really need to deal with the problem of changing the format. So I, I'm very optimistic. I think it's gonna go smoothly because at least when we discuss together, we all agree that it's a good thing and we are working on uh, achieving the, the, the treatment. The rest of the community, I think we just follow effort, effortlessly, if you will. Thanks. Um, and lastly, Dora. Yeah, that's, I, as I said, I, that's the same thing. Like we have the API and the scale will, for example, not we even know that anything is different if it's a GNDS formatted or an NF formatted file that makes a data library. Okay, so a um, little question from Paul Romano. Um, it was mentioned that uh, GNDS can be serialized into XML or HDF5. Uh, for those codes that have implemented support for GNDS, what serialization format is being used in practice? And I think here the, I'd like to, to hand it to both uh, Doro and Caleb, since uh, your implementations are farthest along. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, so, um, so far at Livermore, our, one thing I want to mention is that we we have not quite followed the model that Doro and Fausto described. In, in our case, we have actually let the GNDS data go all the way through to the transport code. Um, and so I think I think that's a, both approaches are pretty reasonable, but that does mean that we have, at the moment, we have XML files that are have all the data in ASCII and the transport codes are reading those. That does mean that there's a fairly big load time right now. So we are working at the moment on um, also getting HDF5 data through to the transport codes. And um, that I've made some progress on that. I've done, we have it working, but we don't actually have it uh, quite spun up at the moment. Um, in fact, we're, we're working on sort of a hybrid solution where the overall hierarchy is in XML, and then we point to an HDF5 file for the, the raw data. Um, so hopefully we'll have that up and that should be part of the Giddy Plus package once it's all ready to go. Yeah, and I was also going to stress that our API works that way that uh, you can serialize it in different things. Not that we can yet, but that it is seen that even the middle layer will not know what the actual undisk format is, whether it's HDF5 or XML, because GNDS is structured so that it has elements and attributes. And as long as you can store elements and attributes, you don't need to know how the elements and attributes are saved on disk. Thank you. Um, so the next question we have uh, is from uh, Luis Dial. Uh, he's asking if Enjoy code is used by obviously many of us in the nuclear data community. So how far along is the GNDS implementation in Enjoy? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have anyone here from Los Alamos on the panel who can speak for them, but um, uh, I think I can give a quick summary. Uh, they actually are uh, implementing it in GND, uh, implementing GNDS. Uh, they're not quite far along because they've been uh, for years in a major rewrite of Enjoy, uh, major modernization, uh, but they have uh, rumor has it, they've been experimenting with a JSON version of GNDS. Um, I'll just leave it as a rumor. Um, so uh, they're expecting to uh, be working on it this fiscal year and hopefully we'll see support in the next year or so. Okay. 
Um, so uh, next question we have is uh, from uh, Mohammed Osman. Uh, is NDF 7, uh, will NDF 7.1 be updated to GNDS or is this only for new libraries like NDF 8 and others? Um, I guess I can take this question since this is an NDF question and I'm the NDF library manager. Um, we actually released NDF 7.1 in GNDS format when it was released, although back then it was still called GND and uh, we didn't announce it. It was more of a trial run. Uh, Fudge still supports everything that uh, the version of NDF, the NDF format that NDF 7 was produced in, so we can translate it uh, anytime you'd like if you want to, to see it. Um, so it's not just the new libraries, but the older libraries as well. And, and I think maybe Caleb can say a little more because this actually uh, is one of the libraries he uses, uses in testing of the translation. Yeah, I, in general, I think that going back in history as much as possible to older libraries is is going to be a valuable thing to do and get them get them into GNDS so that we can run in the future with those older libraries. There are some things to be aware of um, that if there are NDEF format bugs, which there certainly were, um, in fact, part of one of the steps that we did in the preparation of NDEF 7.1 was run our the, the, fudge library, the fudge code has a translator that goes from the NDEF format into GNDS and back. And we ran that on all the files in NDEF 7.1 and helped uncover, it, it, before the release of NDEF 7.1, we helped uncover and fix a lot of these bugs. So there are, when we go back to older libraries, we're gonna run into more of that um, and have to decide what the, the most efficient way is to, to work around those. But um, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so the, the next question we have is from Mark Caleb. Uh, he's asking, are all sub libraries be considered? So far, I have not seen anything but the, uh, on the decay sub library, for example, but perhaps this is already covered. And uh, actually, I'd like to hand this question to Jean Christophe because A, Tendel has more sub libraries than anybody else. And B, uh, he has a, a lot of experience with, uh, with uh, the decay sub library and use in uh, burn-up calculations. Yes, thanks, Dave, and to, to Mark. Uh, well, indeed, uh, if one look carefully, even NDFB8 uh, DK uh, sublibrary has been releasing GNDS, and some of us has already looked at it and tried to implement that directly into the uh, application code. Uh, so it's definitely true. Uh, regarding Tandel, uh, and there I would uh, add something. Um, when we moved uh, from Tandel in MDEF 6 format to GNDS, and thanks to the work of Laurence Ivanor and Caleb, um, we've discovered quite a significant number of little bugs in uh, that automatic library. So yes, every time one uh, translate or one move uh, to GNDS, when we find uh, some errors, some bugs or some uh, glitches, one can call them, that may well not be uh, really important for transport code, but could be for other applications uh, like activation transportations or in fact uh, 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 activation code uh, in the fuel system. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have another question. Um, how frequently do you expect revisions in the GNDS specifications to be made and will they include minor or major changes to what has been published? Um, so this is sort of gets to how we do our work as a expert group to produce the library. Um, so uh, I think I'll hand it to, to uh, one of you on the panel since you all are also involved in the expert group. So uh, perhaps Fausto, would you be interested in answering that question? Oh, muted. <laughs> You're muted. There we go. I'm not muted. No. Uh, you're not. Uh, uh, could you repeat the question, please? Uh, how frequently do you expect revisions in the GNDS specifications to be made? And will they include major or minor changes to what has been published? Uh, well, I don't expect that it's going to stay very, very fixed 
for very, very long because uh, we need to add, uh, to add things. And actually one of the reasons to go from ENDF to GNDS, it was to be able to be more flexible and to make it easier to add things for people who are writing things, and also to read things for people that were reading in it. And going from the NDF to the, uh, uh, to the GNDS, one could even think you could even, with, even without uh, a, a book, you can guess what the data you're reading uh, means. Something was totally impossible with the NDF format. Without the big book, it says exactly what each number means. There was just no way uh, to guess what the numbers you're looking at uh, uh, were. So there will be, I, I expect that, uh, that there will be modification, but it will be much easier to uh, digest them in the processing codes. And I think it will make life easier uh, for everybody. One of the things we certainly need to work on is all the correlations. All correlations are gone once you write the physics to the NDF, uh, to the NDF format. And what we, we would like to do as process, no, as, as computing code, is to keep the correlations. So something, this is something we've touched upon when we discussed, but we haven't really worked out how to implement correlation. But I think it's gonna be a big issue in the next five to many, 10 years. Um. Continuing on this question, though, um, we, we we have produced a GNDS 1.9, which, um, although it doesn't look anything like NDEF, it's all in XML or or whatever format you'd like. But um, structurally, the 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 organization of data looks very NDEF-like, which actually helps with the implementation in the processing codes. So even though the format looks wildly different, it's actually not so different. So in, in a way, the transition from NDEF to GNDS is, is more evolutionary than revolutionary. I mean, the, the, the color of the paint changed, but the, the underlying structure is still there. Uh, that said, GNDS 2.0, the, the next major release, is going to have some major changes to a lot of things that will break backward compatibility. Um, and uh, how fast we can make that release is really a question for the expert group and how efficient we are. Okay. Um, so uh, re returning to a previous question about the, the testing of fudge, uh, I want to hand it to Caleb so uh, you can maybe describe a little more about how you did the round trip testing with the older libraries. Sure. Yeah, so this is a question from Yaron Dainan about uh, our testing. And yes, we actually uh, since we have lots of computing power, especially overnight at Livermore, we, we test several libraries just as part of our nightly tests. And that includes the NDEF 7.1 and NDEF 8 libraries. We try to translate those entire libraries into GNDS and back to NDEF. And then we also tackle the ENDEL libraries, which is Livermore's internal um, and a very different format that one of, one of Livermore's problems for a long time had been that we had this, this different way of representing data than the rest of the world. And uh, so, so four different libraries, they get translated on a nightly basis as part of our fudge testing. Thank you. Um, so our next question comes from uh, Paul Romano. Uh, my understanding is that GNDS is capable of storing data and representations that cannot be handled in NDEF 6. Have any evaluators expressed interest in using these representations? Um, so I'm going to hand it to, to Doro because she's actually supporting Sammy as well as Ampex and w would be very familiar with what the Oak Ridge evaluators really want. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I we want to add new features to the uh, evaluations. First, very simple ones like maybe a complex channel radius and then also more difficult ones later on. And then, of course, want to disseminate them to the community and write them in the GNDS format. And then, as I said, we want to write them semi-natively in GNDS, propagate through MPEX, and then through the through to um, our transport codes. And uh, the thing would be that hopefully we can write it so that old codes still can access it without the features, because GNDS also allows us to give the 1D data or the point-wise data, so maybe we can give both structures. And certainly we want to do the same thing for the covariances. 
Thank you. Um, so uh, another question, um, and uh, this one's from uh, Robert Mills. Uh, as a structure rather than a format, how do you see confirming consistency between different sub-libraries? In other words, things like the isomeric state definition between cross-sections, uh, radioactive decay data, et cetera. Um, yeah, that, this is a tough question because some of it uh, is a very application dependent definition, say for isomers. Um, and it's, a, it's also then gets to the, how the different library projects deal with it. But uh, I think, um, I think I'll hand that question to Jean-Christophe. Um, yes, I mean, uh, we in fact started looking at that in a more, uh, in a quite a complex manner. And um, some proposal has been uh, put forward uh, to the uh, committee of the GNDS uh, for, uh, uh, for those persons to have a look. There is, um, uh, uh, there is some complexity there because one wants to have uh, uh, consistency between the model code, the different sub-library and the way people define isomeric state. And at the moment, I would welcome uh, input from Robert because I'm still discussing with Laurence Livermore about the need to go beyond NDEF6 system there to have something that is fully compatible and we can move forwards in it. So I think the, here we are exactly uh, in the making for GNDS and that was not possible to, uh, to do that at the NDEF6 level. Um, so uh, we have a question from Oscar Cobejos. Uh, do you plan to organize workshops and seminars to train evaluators and other da nuclear data users how to use and manage the new structure? Um, so uh, the short answer to this is yes. The longer answer is uh, we haven't got that far yet. But uh, I would like to open it up to the panel to see uh, they, if they can share their thoughts. Um, uh, can I add something as the... Uh, uh, for the IE point of view, if one of our uh, country member is requesting that we uh, organize an ICTP-like or a workshop seminar on the GNDS, we will oblige and we will do it. Well, that, that may be something we take you up on. And then there's also the possibilities of uh, NEA uh, spun, uh, uh, organized trainings. Um, but uh, we actually have someone on the expert group who's not part of this panel. Uh, Brett Beck, who is going to spearhead some of that. Um, but our, our focus right now has been getting the format defined. And once it's defined, then we can move on to explaining people how it works. So. I think the only thing I would add to that is we've seen a lot of growing interest at Livermore. And so probably my guess is that Brett will end up first teaching these sort of seminars at Livermore is to, to test them out and figure out what's you know, what the right progress is and then uh, but but certainly we're interested in expanding it beyond beyond Livermore. Mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely something we are interested in ramping up in the next year or so. Okay um, so the next question I have is uh, how will we ensure backwards compatibility or ensure uh, or maintain older versions of the the format uh, for how long and and uh, how will that be managed? Um, this is a, a good question and I'm not sure how uh, we're, we're still defining the format. So uh, ensuring backwards compatibility is, is uh, we're not there yet. <laughs> but uh, maybe Caleb, since you, you've been fighting with the development versions of GND before and GNDS now in-house, maybe you have some perspective to share. Yeah, so our our plan right now is to continue supporting GNDS 1.9 since that was the first official version. Um, we have we have not tried to keep up support for all of because we really had a fast churn of different development versions in Fudge um, before GNDS 1.9. But um, 
I think to my mind, what we, what we need here are two tools. We need that the, the APIs are able to go back probably at least five years in terms of the, the last few uh, officially released versions of GNDS. And then we also need a tool that should be able to take an older evaluation and update it into one of the, say the, the latest version. And I think those are actually, both of those tools are pretty easy to, to support. Um, we have played before with the, one of the advantages of storing GNDS as sort of the official exchange format being uh, XML, then there are lots of off the shelf tools that are, are capable of dealing with XML files. And one of them is called an XML style sheet that can do a transformation um, quickly of a lot of big files. And so if it's a matter of, you know, if it's just a matter of rearranging data to be to conform with the latest specification, I think we can take advantage of tools like that. Um, so, yep. Yeah. Um, so uh, the next question we have is from Michael Herman uh, asking, is there progress with getting other communities on board? He means mon mostly NSTEF and X4. Um, this is a tough question because it's kind of outside of our uh, area of control. But um, uh, in the case of NSTEF, I can mention that there is talk in-house at BNL of modernizing NSTEF, although I'm probably not supposed to say that. Um, but uh, I look forward to seeing how that shapes up. As for X4, uh, that's a, actually a question probably for Jean Christophe. Well, X4 uh, will have to adapt or to evolve one way or another. And I think um, the, uh, G, uh, doing that alongside uh, GNDS uh, for that to benefit the structure should be uh, something that need to be think about and uh, proposed. The uh, nuclear data service unit is there to serve its member. Uh, when it, if and when its member uh, do a request, uh, we will certainly consider it. And at the moment, it is true that uh, we are thinking about uh, uh, making a better usage of X4, like uh, shaping the diamond uh, with different cuts. And one of them could be uh, suited uh, for, uh, to, to be embedded, to be more uh, available within the uh, GNDS structure. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time and it's getting close to wrapping up. Um, we might have time to sneak in one more short question. Uh, um, so uh, let me see. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we are out of time, but <laughs> um, so uh, maybe to reiterate, what is the time frame we should expect uh, GNDS to begin replacing existing formats, and how long do we think the transition would take? Um, and this actually, I think, is less of a question for. The GNDS team then for the libraries themselves because they're the ones who decide whether they're going to switch from NDEF to GNDS. And I think we heard from John Christoph that Tendle is already mid switch, and uh, I mentioned that NDEF is already mid switch. So maybe this is a question more for uh, Fausto and uh, uh, Osamu. Uh, well, the um. Uh, as there was a question before there was about uh, the fact how, how how are evaluators uh, getting into the venue and we talked about inside the GNDS uh, a few years ago and actually uh, because the format is for the evaluators to write and for the treatment codes to read that's the purpose and but when we look around the table actually there were more Basically, all the people that uh, were defining the codes, most of them were actually coming from the treatment side and not from the evaluator side. And I understand that correctly because it's useless for the evaluators to write new stuff if nobody can read it. So I think we are doing it in the right order. First, the treatment code 
need to be up to shape with a new format. Once they are, then the evaluator will be able to write new stuff. Uh, and so from the, from the Jeff perspective, uh, what evaluators try to do first is to get the physics right. Uh, and what format to put it is not really a big issue because it's being it's dealt today by fudge. Yeah, I think you can translate from one format or, or, or another. The real issue is can we put new physics in there? So I think once the code treatment will be up to shape with all the existing stuff, then it will be the right moment to get together with the evaluator and say what you would like to put in there, which is more than today. Okay, um, Osamo, uh, if you could say something quickly because uh, it's uh, just about time to end. Yeah, uh, yeah. for our side, that, that uh, if the uh, format is defined in the uh, so uh, then the I think uh, we don't need so much a long time to uh, move to, uh, from the uh, ENDF6 to, to the uh, GNDS format. Uh, but but there are, uh, I uh, also need to the, some benefit to move the uh, GNDS because that is, we need some effort. Uh, then there, that is, uh, I, I don't say that a definite time to move, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Okay, so um, I wanted to thank everyone. This was a very, uh, very interesting uh, roundtable, and uh, I wanted to say that the, the the recording from this webinar will be available on the NEA website. And uh, again, thank you everyone for for attending. Uh, and the there will be more online events like this in the planning in the next coming months. And uh, the next one is on 10th of July, and that's uh, entitled Building a Low Carbon Resilient Electricity Infrastructure with Nuclear Power in a Post-COVID-19 Era. Um, so uh, thank you, and uh, have a good day, everyone.